The Unshackled Waves, Episode 19. Shackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms. It's our first interview show for 2017. Now, we haven't had one for a while, mainly because we need a guest to interview, and most are on holidays at this time of the time of the year. But we are lucky to be joined today by the team behind a fellow Australian alternative uh, news website, altconnews.com, uh, Matt Pete and Justin Bertram. Now, Altcon News have been going uh, for around about the same time as The Unshackled. It started out as a Facebook page, so we thought we would interview them and uh, ask them what they hope to achieve and just have a chat about the state of the world in general. So welcome to the show, guys. No, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks for having us on, Mark. So I'll get into my first question. I guess we, we should start at the beginning. So describe how the creation of Altcon News came about. Well, um, starters, uh, Just and I, we best mates in school, so it only seemed natural when it did eventuate, but I uh, asked Justin to work alongside me with it, but <clears throat> how, it, how it really came to be was I, my phone was crap, it's a, it's a funny story, my phone was crap and it was lagging, I'd have, I'd be, to, to research something and post a status on Facebook, I might have three Facebook windows open, a couple of internet pages, some Twitter, and my phone was just lagging. So I decided that I'd try and work out how to make an app that I could have uh, each of the different political commentators, say your Rita Panais, your Stephen Crowder, your Milo Yiannopoulos, all in the one application so I could click on and have a look at their web page or have a look at their Facebook feed or Twitter feed, all in the one app, and my phone would run a bit quicker. And then I decided that, hey, I, I had it up and running, it was working great, and I thought maybe I could have a live Facebook feed so I could share the important posts, or what I thought was the, the better of the posts of each of the people that were represented in that in that application. And then from there, I, I realised that I was getting a lot of people, well, at that time I had it for about a week, and I'd had four, four maybe, or yeah, three, four hundred people in that first week, two weeks had signed up and, well, they decided to follow or like the Facebook page and I'd had two or three people open the app so I figured that the natural progression would be to focus on the Facebook page and then I wanted to start writing my own articles so started a website and the initial name, uh, the reason behind Altcon is the alternative conservative movement but I believe we're representing and reporting on. So you originally uh, um, fa uh, Facebook page. So why did you decide to sort of? Was it always the plan to go to a fully fledged site, or did just sort of things uh, progress like that? Well, I realised that when I was sharing, when I was sharing, say, an article written by the Australian, that the article might get half a dozen likes and commented on a few times. But when it was an article I was passionate about and I'd write about it and I might write half a dozen paragraphs on it and all of a sudden these these articles that I was writing a lot of paragraphs on, the articles themselves weren't getting so many clicks but they were getting they were getting shared and they were getting the likes were up, the comments were up and I realised that there was more of an audience to my opinion than there was to just the article that had been shared. So then I decided that I'd work out how to make, make a little web page and start writing my own articles and then when that started working on it, I, I just reached out to Justin and Lizzie and Bernard and said, hey, do you, this is what I'm up to, you guys have liked it, you're following it, do you just want to help contribute and they jumped on board. So you two were uh, mates since uh, high school, how did you meet the, the other two contributors that you have? Oh, we actually met them through, funnily enough, uh, A-League banter page on Facebook. <laughs> Um, before we all got kicked from it, but yeah, we were, we we met them through there, and we ended up forming up our own little our own little group in the side, and it was mainly a, a the, a the group. It, yeah, it was a lot of it was just meme sharing, and sort of we all got along, and we all had the same sort of ideas, and and sort of that that that's originally how we all sort of got together, and 
we grew close over the great meme war of 2016 during the Trump election and we realised that we all shared a lot in common politically. So it was just after after grabbing Justin on board, I knew which two others I wanted to bring on with me. Uh, that's yeah, that's uh, certainly an interesting way to to meet uh, to meet people in that in in that regard. I suppose it's the I guess the power of the internet. We can meet all different people who we all have stuff in common with. Yeah, oh. yeah, definitely. I mean, that's it. Chances you wouldn't ha you wouldn't normally meet them in day to day life. I mean, what Lizzie's down in down towards the ACT, Bernard's in Adelaide. So I mean, generally, I mean, it'd be a very long shot if we did actually meet them. And it's the same the same way that we we reached out and we met you guys and we met Ryan from the XYZ and Brendan from Zero Filter and Chris yeah. from Alt Right Australia. It's just been a natural progression for these groups that share similar followers and very similar ideas to meet each other. And in the future, we're probably going to be uh, yeah, well, showing different things together and doing collaboration work. It seems like that's a natural progression of this movement's growth. Yeah, it's, it's certainly very encouraging that there's yeah, so, so many of us willing to contribute. I'll move on to a bit about uh, your uh, political background. So were you politically active before you started Altcon News? Um, personally, I wasn't. And I mean, at the moment, I, I still sort of, to a degree, am not so much. Um, sort of a, a lot of, of mine has just been... I'd see something on TV, I wouldn't like it, and that would be as far as it as far as it had gone in the past. Where now, sort of, I've got a platform now where we can go why we don't like it, why we don't think it's a good idea, rather than just sort of sitting in my lounge room going, "No, that's a bad idea." At least now we can collaborate with like-minded people. It, it may change my point of view if someone someone else can bring up points against what I've done, and I'm more all for that. But yeah, up until up until very recently, I haven't been at all. Where myself, um, I've always, always been opinionated and always ha held political views, uh, more so on the cultural, social side of politics and less on the economic side. But I wasn't, wasn't so politically active up until about that 20, 2014, 2015 mark where I just started to really delve, delve my, my views out and start researching a lot more and instead of just saying this annoys me trying to work out why it was annoying me who had who was behind it who was leading the charge against it what the different options were with different things like the you see all you see all the left jumping up and down and they're rallying and i just wanted to work out what it was about and just back up my ideas of why i disagreed with it so and in the last election, I became a member of the Australian Liberty Alliance, and I, I did uh, letterbox drops for them. And I, I was gonna uh, gonna help out at the election booth, but my son ended up being sick. Little newborn baby was a bit sick that weekend, so I stayed at home and helped the wife look after him instead of doing the down at the polling booths. So, but uh, we've we're both very similar. And uh, so we have a contributor similar in our political views. And we just, it's, to me, it's always been just take a common sense approach to things. And I can't, there's a lot of things I just don't understand why people, uh, I, I'd like to find out why their views are the way they are, especially when they're not of a common sense, not of a common sense, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're just, they're, their views aren't backed by common sense or, any any sort of real foundation they're more they're based on feelings rather than facts yeah so i think that sort of uh yeah what you said there is sort of uh the view of a of a lot of people i mean they're they're seeing what's what's going on uh, in a, in australia and also around the world and just thinking you know this is not the way that you know things are are, are supposed to be and so that's why they're they're starting to you know get active on uh, either if it's a political party or on social media or uh, doing what we're doing. Yeah, it's a case of obviously there is natural progression in the world and things aren't always going to stay the same. But you, we grew up and we had a vision of what the future would be 
and it was for most people I speak to it was very similar to the way we grew up and you look at the way it's changed but it hasn't changed progressively for the better it's changed progressively for the worse I like to say with the identity politics that the left bring in now they're almost bringing in what you could call a left-wing apartheid where instead of they're focusing so much on these individual identity boxes in their identity politics that they're separating people based on things of their gender and their race and I don't see that as helpful I don't see that as contributing to society if anything it's taking away all the progress that was made from the times of your Martin Luther King and saying that judge people judge people based on their character not the color of their skin and nowadays the news isn't based on a person's character if a drug dealer is shot because he he didn't listen to the commands of the police officer that was pointing the gun at him instead of instead of being well this guy was a convicted drug dealer he was out on the streets he'd broken his parole and then he disobeyed the police the story is a white policeman shot a black a black person and I, I don't believe that's a good direction for society to to be moving towards. Yeah, it's certainly. I mean, uh, we're all about the the same age, I think. Um, and it's yeah, it's scary how much the world's changed in or just the the past decade of when we were growing up. Yeah, well, that's that's another point where you look at we're really the first generation being in our 20 like mid mid to late 20s and early 30s early 40s that have grown up under this politically correct umbrella that's been forced upon us and we've had enough of it our the older generations they look down and they, they just think it's codswallop and we've grown up under it and we're just dying to break out from underneath it and if you got to get a you got to get a bit wet being out from under that umbrella so be it yeah, yeah. There's definitely been a lot of change. I suppose. I mean, the internet. I suppose has been. It's worked well for us. I'd imagine it's worked well for for everyone else also in sort of sharing their differing views. So at the same time, I mean, it is. In in what before you'd have one person with one idea, now you have a hundred people with one idea, in one area. It, it does get a bit more. I suppose louder, being that it is an echo chamber, and that some people do listen to. Yeah, I think the, the internet's definitely been fantastic for connecting like-minded people with each other and uh, yeah, letting, letting people know that they're not alone. Um, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll go back to talking about uh, your website. So Altcon News is still a very young site like the Unshackled. Uh, you mentioned it just before briefly. So what are your plans to expand in the, the short and long term? Uh, with the with the website, we have we have discussed about potentially running a podcast, and uh, very similar to what you're doing and some of the other sites are doing. Uh, we're not sure yet the ins and outs of whether we would look at running, say, a weekly or a fortnightly or a monthly style podcast, or whether we just look at waiting until a current event happens that has that's peaked that's peaked interest and just say myself and Justin or Justin and Lizzie or myself and Bernard would just have a Skype chat and set that as the podcast and just release our thoughts on what's just happened and whether they were short videos or long videos with to topics of interest is still something to be discussed but we've also thought about uh, starting up a YouTube, YouTube uh, site, YouTube page which would be the platform to release those but also for sharing sharing the videos that we find of interest. So when Stephen Crowder shares a video and I watch it and I share it to my standard Facebook page and it's something that I feel is important for people to watch, it it's something that I would look at posting into the into our YouTube channel for our subscribers to hopefully view. And yeah, I mean in in the shorter term, I mean we have got a few um a few bio bio uh, biopic topics to be released in the shorter term that we're looking at. Um, so I can't really give much more detail on that now because it still is very very early stages of it. But sort of, I mean, yeah, we definitely are looking to expand in in sort of a few different ways, and we'll, we'll take it as it comes. Really, we'll see. Yeah. We'll put the feelers out there as we do it. See how it's see how it's received, and we'll, yeah, we if it gets a good reception, we'll we'll devote more time to it. Otherwise. 
I mean, we started off as a as a news site. We'll, we will continue to be a news site. But it does seem there is uh, a few of our a few of our writers like Justin and Lizzie. They are very they're history buffs, and it does seem uh, that if we can do spread out and range our topics a little bit differently. So when people sure they're still reading the current events, they're reading our our recently posted articles, but we do want to have a branch off section where, as Justin said, we haven't 100% dedicated any topics, but we could have topics like, say, a section dedicated to 20th century dictators, where you can click on and read our opinions of these dictators, what they stand for, and how they're like someone like, say, Karl Marx or Joseph Stalin, and you can, you can refer back to those on how they're mirroring the, those on the left now with their socialist and communist views and how it's it's generally, it's like the old saying says, those who fail to know that, learn their history are doomed to repeat it and you can look at the downfalls of what's happened, why it's happened, why it's going to happen again if things don't change. But then we've got other topics where uh, like Elizabeth's looking at doing, she's looking at doing a, a series on the monarchy and how the monarchy affects modern day Australia. Um, the Queen is getting up in age, and what's going to be next for the monarchy, and how the Australian people will feel about that, and what the general consensus take will be on it. Yeah, I definitely think it's uh, important for or for any new site to cover um, yeah, as much. As, as much areas of interest uh, as possible. So you've mentioned that, uh, like, obviously you're, uh, you prefer to sort of focus on uh, cultural cultural issues uh, and social issues rather than economics. What sort of, like, the stories that you've posted so far, what do you think generates the, the most interest in terms of your readership? I think at the moment, I don't think you can go past anything involving Australian immigration, I suppose. It's probably one of the, the biggest four clicks at the moment. That, that, that is the biggest. Our views, our views have, they dramatically increase not only on Facebook but on our webpage. If we've released a story or there's a current event happening that involves especially Malcolm Turnbull, refugees, immigration, our current audience, that's what they're interested in. That's what they're clicking on, and that's what's bringing them to our site and opening and watching watching these the videos and reading our opinions on those topics. Uh, with yesterday's Indonesian Indonesian military uh, tie cutting news, that's that's drawn an incredible amount of views. Uh, our, we're we're projected on current stats at the moment that this week will be our best our best week in our history. Obviously, we have more viewers, but. We're, after three or four days of this week, we're sitting statistics-wise better than we have any other week if we merge two or three of them together. So that that there that there shows what our current uh, our current followers are interested in. But I believe I believe it's not so much focusing on cultural issues anymore, there and less political. It seems what with what the left have done to our society and to our politics, that cultural issues and political issues have kind of merged into this one running theme where I don't believe the traditional left and right wing of politics are what they were once were. Like you look at a Mark Latham now. Mark Latham, when he ran against John Howard, he was the opposition leader for the Labor Party. So he would have been classified as a left-wing politician. And that was back when it was based purely on, there was so social issues, but economy was a large factor. Nowadays, the people that are referred to as right-wing, the people that are referred to as left-wing, it's not based on their economic views anymore as much as it's based on their, their social views. And that's where I believe that society and politics have they really have merged to the point where, like I said, right wing and left wing are no longer economic terms. Yeah, that's that's certainly true, and uh, it's interesting that a lot of old school uh, left wing people, like I use Bill Maher as an example, who, yeah, twenty years ago he was fighting the right pretty much on everything, but now he pretty much can't stand the left and progressives. So you're certainly right that sort of. Of uh, cultural issues are sort of realigning uh, the political landscape quite a bit. I, 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 I agree with what you're saying, but I take a different view on Bill Maher personally, where I believe when it comes to Islam, 
I believe Bill Maher is very much a right-wing thinker, and I believe he can see the dangers of Islam without being swept up by the politically correct society. But the way he berated Trump and went on about Trump leading up to that election and his full support was behind Hillary, I don't see him as a left-wing media shill purely because of his uh, objection to Islam, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't show him 100% into the right-wing ballpark. If anything, he's centrist at best, in, yeah. my, in my opinion. Yeah, I, that's, it's certainly interesting to see, yes, just sort of, yeah, how, how politics has just, just changed so much. I'll, uh, next question I'll ask you, uh, obviously, um, Dev, no, you're just starting out with Altcon News, which means you're you're doing it in your free time. So, uh, and obviously, we at the Unshackled would like to do this as well. We're, we're, you you would eventually like to do this as a as a job. Like, would you like to you know monetize it, attract advertising? Yeah, I'm. Uh, obviously, that is the plan. I'm. When it comes to the easiest, everyone knows the easiest way to attract an income through a website is with either clickbait or having your annoying pop-up ads. Now, we're not a fan of clickbait. Uh, like with the, uh, an example of that, with the Julian Assange speaking to Sean Hannity. Now, I posted an article about it with a link to the, to the video of the conversation between Julian Assange and Sean Hannity. Now, I was seeing every second article written about it. It said, uh, click, click here to find out what Julian Assange said about such and such. Or did did Russia really hack the election? Find out when you click here. And I'm not interested in that. If I wanna I wanna build an audience for the right reasons. So it it my article was t entitled uh, Julian Assange and Julian Assange and Sean Hannity discuss why Russia did not influence the election. So I would rather people click on it for the right reasons than have it clickbait. So that said, I'm not looking at doing any pop up ads. I, I I dislike them. I feel that they draw more, they push more people away than they draw in. But uh, when it comes to your tasteful ads, like you, I'll use the Australian as an example, where you'll scroll through an article and you might see an advertisement for a Toyota Camry in the middle of an article, just as a picture, and you can click on it. Will hyperlink off to a website. If we were approached and able to advertise like that, then sure, I'd go for it. I don't believe it takes away from the article, and I don't believe that it's a cheap cheap way to advertise but I think that that would be that would be a good way to start uh, monetizing um, we're also looking we've had ideas for maybe supplying a membership with merchandise and selling off some merchandise so with that we've we've got ideas about um, I've had ideas about some stickers and uh, a couple of different hats like you can see here I'm wearing the make Australia great again hat now I've this is this isn't mine I, I did I did buy this online but I have ideas for similar style hats and I'm looking at looking getting a couple of prototypes made up, and then gauging gauging our audience, engaging what they might be interested in making. Because to get something like that, you are looking at buying in bulk, so buying a hundred or so, and that that's not cheap. So I want to make sure that I'm not going to waste my money, and I want to make sure that people are interested in buying it. And then Justin's come up with ideas such as stubby holders and magnets, and just. The meme, the meme culture takes off, and people enjoy. Like you look at Pepe the Frog or Harambe, people were people were buying them. They were they weren't buying them because they wanted to donate money to the site, but they were buying because they liked them. They thought they were fun. They were cheap, and it was just it was a good way for the people selling them to make a little bit of money. And it's it's a real catch twenty two trying to do something like a media platform like this where. You, you need money behind you so you can focus more time and effort developing your stories and uh, say if you want to run videos and go out and interview people, you need that you need that time behind you. And when unlike a lot on the left, we're out doing full time jobs, it's a bit hard and you are doing this in your in your spare time. So any way to make a bit of money is going to be beneficial so you can grow the site and the more money you make the bigger your site gets uh, the wider you can expand your interests and what is what available content you have and hopefully the bigger you get you don't start something like this because you want to stay small you want to get big I look at I look at Breitbart and I look at Infowars and I would love I would love to be able to do this as a full-time career but we, it's just a case of slowly growing from the bottom and see where it leads us 
Yeah, I certainly take uh, inspiration from uh, the Matt Drudge story. Uh, 20 years ago, he was just uh, working at a convenience store. Now he's making millions of dollars a year with, uh, with the Drudge Report. So, yeah. The thing, the thing with Matt Drudge is he's another one of those where he's making the millions of dollars, but his content hasn't changed. Making millions of dollars hasn't stopped him from doing what he started to do. And that's what I like. He's, <laughs> he started something and he started it for a reason. He wanted to get real news out to the people. And that hasn't stopped just because he's making money. He hasn't turned into a shill. And that's what I can see discussing discussing different topics and points of view with other guys like you, you guys, the Unshackled, uh, the XYZ, Zero Filter, All Right Australia. We all have the same goals where, sure, we'd love to make money and we'd love to become a big recognized company. But we don't want to let any form of money or ego get to your head and start shilling out and becoming another new Matilda or Huffington Post where you're just posting crap for the because you've already got the money. Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, you've got to, you've got to make sure that you're still producing yeah good content and well, content. making sure you're you're doing right by your by your viewers. Yeah, I mean, get, getting the viewers in there is only the first step. I mean, you've got to keep them interested. You've got to keep You've got to, I mean, how many, how many media outlets are there at the moment? Why would someone come to us? What's our point of difference? That's what we have to look for, and that's what we have to, to put forward. And then it runs off the same reason where I, uh, I, I respect WikiLeaks as an organisation because you look at WikiLeaks, and sure, at the moment, the mainstream media is trying to say, oh, look, WikiLeaks, they're reporting, they're biased, and they're reporting this and that because Russia did really hack the election and they've been bought... Well, I, I, I find that complete BS because the the reason people, uh, the reason WikiLeaks is respected and the reason people view WikiLeaks is purely because in the history of WikiLeaks they've never released a false, they've never released anything false. Everything they've released has been proven to be correct. So I that's that's what I use as a platform, a goal to be one day viewed like a WikiLeaks in that everything we release, whether it whether it's a pro-conservative or a bad story about the conservative side, if Donald Trump does something horrible or Cory Bernardi one day is our leader and he does something horrible, it, just because we're on that side of politics doesn't mean that we should shill for them and cover it up. We should still report it as unbiased news because facts are more important than feelings and facts are more important than factions. Yeah, if he if he doesn't build the build the wall, you know, uh, we'll we'll be the first to criticize him. And that that's it. Yeah, it's all about build, build that wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, most 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 of it most of it's fences at the moment with your prison wire, mm -hmm. and they but they do seem to forget that Hillary did back the building of the wall uh, before Trump got into politics. I'm pretty sure she was so, a fence. So she's obviously yeah. nicer. So she's putting a fence in a wall. It's well, totally different. But we'll see what we'll see what happens with the wall. I mean, the same thing is. I mean, you look at that same mainstream media where what six, seven years ago, or longer than that, they, they were they were jumping on WikiLeaks. It's interesting that uh, the mainstream media were they were perfectly fine to quote from Wiki, from WikiLeaks and they were perfectly fine to link to WikiLeaks sources when WikiLeaks were discrediting the Bush organization. But as soon as WikiLeaks comes out and they're discrediting the Democrats and Hillary Clinton. All of a sudden, they're fake news. So that tells you all you need to know about the mainstream media. When their sources work with them, they're great. And when their sources work against them, they're fake news. So, so I'll move on to my next question now. Uh, so Altcoin News, The Unshackled, and other like-minded sites are often described as alt-right. Now, I'd like to get your opinion on what the term alt-right means to you and whether you embrace the term. Um, I don't know. I mean, really, it's it's just another term. I mean, it's not it's nothing different to what, what what it was before or what we were after. It's just another name for us at the moment. But at the same time, I mean, to me, it is we're conservative, but not in a traditional sense. In that we still do want to see some progress, but we want the core values of what we were to stay the same, with different changes in between that. And I mean, obviously, as as the as the days get on, I mean, technology is going to advance, and we're, I mean, we'll, that that would be a new medium for us. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's not really 
it's hard to sort of put words to what you are, I suppose, more than... Well, I, I believe that there are, there are two alt-rights. There's, the, there's what I call the mainstream alt-right, and that is there are the people that jump behind Donald Trump. There are the people that jump behind Pauline Hanson, that jump behind Brexit, where, as Justin said, we're not traditional, 100% traditional conservatives, and we do have a, a throw in a mix of libertarian values, and there are some left wing values thrown in there, especially a lot of our fans and a lot of our followers would be uh, economically left wing. But as I was saying before, culturally they relate more to the right, and that's where I believe that the alt right term is. Now, you, uh, Spencer might have coined the term the alt-right term, but I, the, the, the Spencer fans, the, the Sig Hale fans, the 1488s, they make up a minimal 0.5 to 1% of anyone that's on the alt-right. And the media claiming that every single person on the alt-right and all the Trump supporters are Nazis because half a dozen people were doing the Sig Hales in a hall, well, that it's it just shows the media's hypocrisy because... When Richard Di Natale came out in, in Parliament and he said that uh, all Trump supporters, they're, they're Nazis, they're racists, they're bigots, they're this, they're that, they're Islamophobes, and he's just throwing out their ifs and their isms. And that's because a, a small, tiny group had these beliefs. But when a couple of weeks ago, when it was announced that Lee Rhiannon and David Shoebridge had come out and they backed this new left wing, far left wing faction, the left room, who, whose motto is that they're anti-capitalism and anti-police, he was the first, Richard Dean Tully was the first to jump up and say, the Greens don't support these guys and these guys are only a small faction within the Greens and we, they don't stand for our core values. Well, if they don't stand for your core values, but you're the first person to say that the 1% of Trump supporters who are white supremacists stand for all Trump supporters, either, well, check yourself before you wreck yourself, mate. Yeah. You, hypocr it's, it's hypocrisy. It's either, it either works both ways or it doesn't work. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, no, uh, nobody, especially the mainstream media, judges the entire left on the, the actions of the socialist alternative. Yeah, hundred percent. They're not being judged by their one percent, but we are judged by our one percent. I believe they are. They are attempting to discredit the the name, the alt right, before it really gets a foothold in Australia. Before most people understand what it is and what it's about, but it's just going to become another one of those terms. I I've been called a racist, a homophobe, a sexist, an Islamophobe, a bigot. It, I know I'm not. My f friends and family know I'm not. My readers know I'm not. So you just brush it off. And when alt-right becomes the term they use to describe all the new conservatives and they use it in a way of calling us bigots, Islamophobes, this and that, well, it's just going to be another term that we brush off. So I believe the left are doing more to damage themselves and push more people towards us than they are to pull people away from us. So let them go. If they want to call us, the more they call us racist, the more people say, well, what's this guy really saying? They have a look, they realise, hey, they're not racist. Well, I'll listen to what else they have to say. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the name calling, I mean, if, someone, if you're going to look into going, why is he this? Why is he that? You're going to look into him, you're going to go, hang on, I may or may not have similar views and stick around. I mean, I, I think... I think the, the, the constant name calling and belittling in public, I think, has done a lot of harm to, to their cause more than more than benefit. Their words have lost all their yeah. power, it, and that's that is the thing. They've they've claimed they've claimed racism and homophobe so many times that their words have literally lost all their power, and people brush them off. They do not have the same effect that they once did, and people just don't care if they're called those words anymore. But one thing you, I will say, I don't I don't refer to Richard Spencer's as the alt-right, he might have coined the term, but how many people go up and they, they buy a domain name and wait for someone else to buy it off them? That doesn't mean that they represent that name. It just means they jumped in and grabbed the name first. Mm. Now, it is, it is interesting to point out that the, alt, the far alt-right, the far right, have more in common with the far left than either of them would ever agree. You just look, what's the, what's the number one thing they both agree on? And that is 
get rid of Israel, give it to Palestine. They, they both agree they hate, they hate the Jewish people. And I think when one of your biggest platforms is free Palestine, and they both agree on that, they both agree that the, that the Jewish people are the cause and problems of all the world, well, you guys are very similar. You, you're, you're a lot further, a lot closer to each other than you are, than you are to any, anyone else in the middle. That's the thing. I mean, it, it does. In the end, it does turn into a sphere that if you go too far one way, you will end up coming back around, and you will end up. You go yeah. too. You go too far right. You go full circle. You come full. You yeah. come come up on the far left side. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. Um, I have on my next question. So I'm of the view that 2016 was was probably uh, most important year in in recent memory because. It was the beginning of the fight back against the, the progressive left. Do you agree that the tides are turning? I mean, obviously, we saw Brexit, Pauline Hanson return, uh, and Trump. I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. I, I think we're going to have to look and see how, how, the, how it goes, whether it continues on. But I'm still debating whether it is a fight back against the left or if it's a fight back against politicians in general. And, I mean, you, you have... I mean, Donald Trump isn't that far right, realistically. I mean, he's he obviously he's, he's the head of a right-wing party, but a lot of his personal views are a lot more central, whereas similar to Pauline Hanson, she's right-wing on immigration. Everything else, she'd be centre, left, right. It would scatter. She wouldn't so much be a, a far right on, on everything. I think it's more that people are fed up with politicians and being told one thing and just... I mean, Trump wasn't a politician. That that is one of the facts that he did um, he did promote in his campaign that he is not a politician. Pauline Hanson the same. And Brexit was we don't want to be told what to do by the EU by unelected officials yeah. who don't have our best interests in mind. So I'm I'm still I mean, look, I suppose in one way, yes, it is a fight back because a lot a lot of these people are bringing up common sense values in the I mean. You should live your life to a common sense code that everyone should know the rules to already, and you shouldn't have to be dictated to about other things. And but yeah, I'm I'm not sure whether it is. A, I suppose we will see this year. It will go a lot further in other elections around the world. But whether it is a fight back against politicians in general, or whether it's a fight back against the left at the moment, I'm not 100 percent. So I'm. I'm a, I'm a little bit different to Justin there, where I believe 2016 was a very important year. I believe it will go down as a milestone. Uh, it'll be remembered as the year that the silent majority, as it's been coined, stood up, had enough. And that was shown by Trump being elected. That was shown with the return of Pauline Hanson. It was shown with Brexit. Shown that people are sick of, as Justin said, they're sick of politicians. And... Donald Trump doesn't talk like a politician. Pauline Hanson doesn't talk like a politician. They like that. They like that these are people that you listen to them and they sound like someone that you'd meet down at the shops talking to. They're, they're, not, the, they're not the most articulate people in the world, but at the same time, look what Barack Obama's done. Now, does Barack Obama give a fantastic speech? He sure does. But what are you looking for in your president or your prime minister? Are you looking for the world's greatest public speaker or someone who's got your best interest at heart? Now, that's the reason I believe 2016 was important. We stood up. Now, we stood up to the, we have stood up to the left and we have stood up and shown that we're not happy with the political direction that our countries have been taken in. So I believe 20, 2016 we stood up and 2017 we're, we're gonna show that we're fighting back. There's elections happening over in Europe, and at the moment it looks like France's uh, Front National, uh, fronted by Le Pen, is going to, I reckon they're going to they're gonna go great guns. And then you've got Germany, uh, Deutsch, Deutsch of Germany, I, I'm not too, not too well versed on the German politics, but from what I have read, they're, they're what has been coined by the mainstream media as their far right group, looks like it's doing well. And then Geert Wilders, from, the, the Dutchman from Holland, He's, or the Netherlands, yeah. as they call. called, uh, he, he's going great guns. And he's got, ever since they tried to shut him down over his statements on Islam, he, his popularity has grown because the people are sick of what's happening in Europe. They're, they're sick of the globalist initiative. They're sick of the immigration. They're sick of the fact that on New Year's Eve in, it was a Germany or France, New Year's Eve last Germany. year, Germany, yeah, all those, those women were all raped and the mainstream media 
jumped up and down and said, oh, we can't come to conclusions, even though it had come out that they were all raped by refugee men. They'd all raped all refugees, as they were. Mm. They, they, they're not refugees. You don't, you don't, you don't walk through twelve safe countries to end up at end up in Germany just so that way they've got the best welfare. <laughs> mm. They've got the best welfare, and they've got the women that they want to touch. It's, so the people are sick of it. And uh, yeah, and it was interesting as well that the even though the entire mainstream media was against Trump against Brexit, the people still said, you know, no, we're not, we're not listening to you anymore. You know, we want to take back control over, uh, over our own destiny. And they voted accordingly. And that's where, that's where the, the fake news, the fake news title that they come out with, it, it's lost all its power because every, pe people have realised, every single news source that's been lambasted as fake news are the ones that said Trump will win. And the real news are, are apparently all the all the people that said Trump's failing, Trump's not going to win, Clinton's got it in the bag. Where where and they were just shilling out for Clinton. Well, sorry, you guys are the fake news when you weren't reporting the right polls, and you weren't reporting the right statistics. You're the fake news. Whether whether you like the opinions of the other people or not, when they're correct and what they've said is backed by facts, it's it's not. Fake news and the the term fake news and what it looks like Facebook's going to be doing with the the warning late logos on anything that Politico and Snope and the fact checkers class as fake news. All that's going to do. People are going to see something and it's going to say, "Oh, warning! This is fake news." And you know, say, "Right, so this warning. is this is what I want to read." People are smart enough to know that you 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 Bell Tower Times and your Batuta Advocate, your your basic, your fake news, your your chaser. You're you're just, a bit of fun. Yeah, the the bit of fun. They they understand that, and they sure there are proper fake news, and they you can generally tell the clickbait and the real fake news. Mm. So when people see these titles, and I can guarantee it's not going to be your Batuta Advocates that are lambasted with the fake news title. It's going to be things like Infowars, and it's going to be your Breitbart. So, and then look what they've come out with today. Their, their new thing against Milo is apparently he's GQ's uh, worst dressed person of 20, 2016. It's just. It must uh, be heartbreaking. Yeah, story. it must be heartbreaking. <laughs> it's just, it's not news. It's just, it's slander. And pe people can work it out. People aren't silly. If people were silly, Hillary Clinton would have been voted in, Brexit would have been voted down, and the Greens would be in control of our country. People aren't that silly. I think the perfect example of yeah the mainstream media being the fake news is when they reported on all those fake hate crimes after uh, Trump won. I mean they they reported them all as fact, but when you know people actually investigated, they all turned out to be uh, just made up. Yeah, that's it. Hundred percent. You have you had all these uh, the Mo the Muslim woman who apparently they took off her veil and they they attacked her for wearing a veil, and it comes out that it all it it was all made up. It was fabricated. It never happened. Meanwhile, it, today it came up the the girl that she Facebook lived for 30, thirty something minutes, but where they they grabbed a white a white fella. These these what well, uh, three or four of them, and. They, they grabbed him, they tied and bound him to a chair and they hassled him and they harassed him and they beat him and they, at the end they ended up making him saying F, F white people and F Donald Trump and it was it was a kidnapping and they Facebook lived it and they thought it was great and they claimed that he was the racist. Well, I'm sorry, you, you attacked him because of the colour of his skin, because of his political views and you guys are the racists and the bigots and they've since been, the four of them have been arrested by the Chicago police, and it's come out that the bloke had special needs. Now, the mainstream media has reported zip on it. It's been your people, your Stephen Crowder, your Infowars, and Paul Joseph Watson, your Rita Panahi. They've come out and they've reported on this, and they've told it for what it is, that the, the true racism lies with the mainstream media because not only have they not reported on this, that's not racism. What's racism is that if it had been a black special needs person that was that was kidnapped by four people wearing Make America Great hats and they made that person say F Hillary Clinton, F black people, it would be on the 6 p.m. news headline story on every single left-wing media outlet worldwide but that in the Western world. And that's where the true racism was. 
Yeah, uh, I just saw that in the past day, and yeah, it was just yeah horrific. Oh, um, it was disgusting. Yeah. It was disgusting. It was vile. Yeah. I mean, you see, you see a lot of that now. Where the only way people are getting caught is they're posting it on Facebook. I mean, and it's still taking time for for people to show up and call. I mean, at, at that point, you've got to. I mean, you've got the video evidence of it. You've got this and that. I mean, surely that that's a lot more than what the traditional your, your traditional media outlets what what they were reporting on earlier. They they had a claim and that was it. When now they've got video evidence, they've got proof that they can say this happened and they've been quiet. Where before they would run with an accusation and but now because it doesn't fit their narrative they've they've just remained silent and tried to bury it and uh, another another good thing they do is and you always say it and it, it personally it, it draw it drives me nuts where you'll They'll, they'll have a story, and it is an allegation, but it's against a straight person, a white person, a male, a straight white male. And they'll say, so-and-so has done this, has done that, has done this. But when the Orlando Orlando massacre happens at the Pulse nightclub, or when the, the Cologne uh, truck happens, or when uh, the, the Nice truck attack happens, what do they say? Oh, the alleged attacker. The alleged this, the alleged that. They're so quick to distance themselves from admitting that there was any form of Islamic terror attack and in any form it was related to Islam, but it's alleged this, alleged that. But apparently a Trump supporter pulls off the, mm. the hijab of a Muslim woman on a US campus, at a mm. college campus, and it's such and such racist and he was a Trump supporter and this and that, or when the guys dressed up as the sheikhs and imams and went up to the Gosford Anglican Church and they walked inside and they started doing a mock beheading and chanting and saying, Allahu Akbar, what did the media jump to? Straight away, they're like, well, such and such has a picture of Pauline Hanson as a cover photo on his Facebook. So we have to we have to ask Pauline Hanson her opinion on these people and why they're Hanson fans and why they support One Nation and does One Nation defend these acts and it's just it's blatant smear attacks it's it's ridiculous they they've lost all credibility in my books. Uh, we'll move back to Australia now and it seems that uh, even though significant victories have happened overseas we're still up against it here i mean the left still control the political class the, the cultural institutions and the media uh you know uh, how do you think uh is the best way to push back against against that here and you know retake our country i mean generally in the past um, the election has been decided by whoever the daily telegraph backed they, they've they've pretty much been the winner on but at the same time, I mean, there, there is no alternative. You have left wing or a little less left wing. There are two <laughs> options. They're, they're, they're pretty much our options yeah. for, for prime minister. Left wing or centre left. Yeah, or centre left. I mean, it, it's not really, you're not going left versus right. You, yeah, you're going two left wing parties that you're pitting up against each other. The people have been voting for the lesser of two evils. Yeah, there, there's no... I mean, realistically, if you want to change it, we need we need to have some sort of alternative to it. At the moment, there's no alternative. So people, rather than voting on who they want to win, are voting on who they don't want to lose. Uh, yeah, writing, rather than voting on who they want to win, they're voting against who they want to lose. Well, that's like this, yeah. this, this election, the Australian election, the federal election, to me it was a win, and it goes to what Justin was saying. Now, there was no one I wanted to win, but what I what the perfect outcome for me was was Labor to lose, the Greens to get as minimal seats as possible, Turnbull and the, the Liberal Coalition to win by the skin of their teeth to send him a message that he has lost the supporter base with his actions. I wanted every one of Turnbull's mates that backstabbed Abbott to lose their lose their positions, and most of them did. And I wanted your right, your right of wing parties to make up that cross bench to really make a difference. Now, you saw Hanson got four seats. Xenophon got a few. Obviously, he's not right wing, but Xenophon got a few. Uh, Hinch got a seat. Now, to me, that for who we had running and what the pol politics were leading up to it, it was a great result. Turnbull got the message. Well, I don't. The Liberal Party got the message. I don't think anything sunk into Turnbull yet. I think his ego is 
his ego is that large. He, he, he thinks his shit doesn't stink. Turnbull, I don't think he understands there is a problem. But the conservative backbone of the Liberal Party, your Cory Bernardis, your George Christensen, your Tony Abbott, they realise there's a problem. Now, hopefully that does push change in a direction, whether it be a, a Liberal Party reassessment of where they're headed and what their values are, or whether Cory Bernardi does this Australian majority that we've reported on, whether it does become a political party and not just an organisation such as his Australian Conservatives, where you sign up and he's giving you a newsletter one, once a week. Now, I'm hoping that it, whatever, whatever he does, whether he splits and takes, hopefully, the, the backbone of the Liberal and the National Conservatives with him, and then they work alongside your One Nations and your right wing candidates, your smaller minority parties. Like you look at the the vote the vote split. Now, if you you rise up Australia, you love it or leave it party, Australian Liberty Alliance. If all of those if all of those parties along with One Nation, if they had all been a single party and put their in a, in a way, not, not to discredit anyone, but if they, instead of being ego-backed and saying, we've got 10, 10 parties here, let's make another one because I differ with these people on a single issue. If they all work together, put their best minds into one group, which I'm hoping Corey Bernardi has been speaking about and he's going to rally them all together. If you had one group there to receive all those votes, there would be senators in, there would be senators in parliament and it would look different. Now, when they get 4,000 votes, or four and a half thousand votes here and there spread across nine different people. Well, none of them get enough votes to get into parliament. But if if five or six people's four and a half thousand votes went to one party, then all of a sudden you got three or four people in, and you can outnumber the Greens, and you can get rid of that trash from our government. I mean, not only that, but you've you've also got to give us an alternative to vote for. I mean, ha having members in the Senate's all well and good, but. You know, there's no real decisions that are made, really, at a Senate level. I mean, the Senate will um, negotiate, I suppose, for a, for a lack of a better term. They'll block. Yeah, on what to pass and what to allow. But at the same time, we need people at the base pushing their ideas forward, which it's not really happening at the moment. So at the moment, yeah, it's, you look at you look at Paul, Pauline Hanson and the... She has come out and, in a sense, taken the moral high ground where she said that she won't, she won't hold the government hostage to get any of her policies across, which is what uh, your Nick Xenophons have done. Yeah. But at the, sa at the same time, she, I, I'm giving, I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt leading into 2017. That as much as I don't agree with so much holding the government hostage to get a single policy across, she ran on a, on a, on a list of, she ran on a list of policies. Yeah, four policies. That and people voted on her for those policies. And if she wants to be re-elected and she wants to keep the heart of the people, she needs to do something about those policies, not just mention it once and have a government say no and then sit back down and wait for the next vote. She needs to, much as a lot of people don't like it and don't like the way it's done, she might need to hold the government hostage on a couple of key issues so they can at least look at certain policies of hers to keep the the silent majority happy to give us what we what we voted her for to give us what she was put in place to do i mean pe pe people voted four of her senators in that's obviously enough votes the, the they're not so much a nothing force i mean she she is representing quite a few people she's representing yeah. a lot of people and, and now come, come the queensland yeah. state election she's going to be representing even more yeah i mean at the same time she needs to, if she's got a policy, she needs to be the first steps to put it into motion. As far as I'm aware personally, she hasn't done that. Not that it's, I mean, she's only been elected for six months, but at the same time, she hasn't. And they spent that, about three months of that on holidays. Yeah, well, she, so. she hasn't been, if you want something done, you've got to do it yourself. I mean, that's, that's what I've always been taught. If, you, if you're passionate about something, you, will, you push towards it and hope that people follow you, not hope that people listen to her and get it through. Yeah. The, that said, going back to your original question, the less control. Now, I think there, we have to keep keep our, keep our we, we've gained traction. We have to keep our wheels rolling, keep where we're going, but I don't think there's anything too drastic that we have to do. We, our politicians, they, they've seen, they, with Trump's win, with Brexit, 
there's a fire lit under the conservative asses of those politicians. Now, they know that the silent majority are concerned about Islam. They know that they're concerned about immigration, terrorism, refugees. They're sick of hearing that Islam is the religion of peace after every single terrorist attack. They're not, they're not having to say that uh, Judaism is the religion of peace and they're not jumping out and saying Hinduism is the religion of peace, but every single time there's an attack, you, you don't even need to hear it's Islam to know it's is Islamic related. Now, people are also sick of they're sick of hearing that we our budget's got to tighten and pensioners have to lose this money and carers have to lose this money after supporting this country and paying taxes. Meanwhile, all of a sudden, up oh, we're going to bring in we're going to up and bring in another nineteen thousand refugees and we're going to house them and we're going to pay them and we're going to give them hardship allowances and we're going to be earning more money than your refugees, well, uh, then your pensioners. Well, I'm sorry, but charity starts at home and you need to look after your own people first. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. Why should, I'm of the belief that any true refugee that isn't just looking for welfare, it's actually looking to make for a safe haven and they're looking for somewhere to make a new life for themselves. I don't understand why they should even consider Australia because what they, they could go walk down the streets of Melbourne. Now, Melbourne at the moment has the highest homeless rate that it's had in, in its history. Now, all these homeless people, are, are they refugees? No, they're, they're citizens. They're Australian citizens who have the right to vote, but they don't have the right to a home. Meanwhile, our government's bringing in another 19,000 refugees. The Greens, God love them, want to bring in another 55,000 refugees. Now, where are these people going to go? Where does the money come from? Or is that why they're cutting the, our pensioners' pay? Now, if I was one of those refugees and I was serious about coming to Australia and making a life for myself, I'd be asking myself, how long is this country going to look after me? How long are they going to care? While all these, the same, the usual suspects are out having their rallies about whatever the hot topic is that week, whether it's Black Lives Matter, a feminist rally, or pro-refugees, get rid of Nauru and Manus, are they, they're, they're championing these refugees. But are they still going to champion the refugees six years in, into being Australian when they go out and they become an Australian citizen and they, they want to live an Australian life and something doesn't go right for them and all of a sudden that family's homeless? Are they, they're going to be out on the streets with the rest of the Aussie citizens that are homeless and no one's going to be jumping up and down and championing them in. They're not going to be saying we need to get these ex-refugees off the streets and into houses because they've got another 19,000 refugees that they need to go virtue signal and wish wish well and try and get into the country. So if I was one of those refugees, I'd be questioning whether or not Australia is the best place to come to. When, How long are we going to look after them? How long are we going to give them refuge? We don't even give our own citizens refuge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's ridiculous that, you know, we're, we've got these huge, huge re uh, refugee programs that are clearly clearly unaf unaffordable. Another uh, key issue that we've got in Australia is that uh, you know, political correctness and just if, if somebody, like if somebody in the media or a politician says, you know, something which, you know, doesn't fit the uh, politically correct agenda, they must, you know, apologise, their, their job. they should lose their job, you know, they should be hounded out of, you know, pol a polite society. Like, for example, you know, there were calls for Sonia Kruger to be sacked after she came out against uh, Islamic yeah. immigration. How dare Sonia Kruger care about her country and how dare, her, how dare she want her children to grow up in a, in a wonderful country? The, the horror. I can't, I can't believe can't believe that she went out and said that. But it was, the worst thing it was, was so hurtful. Said. She even backed it up with facts, such as the higher percentage of Islamic people in a country, the higher the chance and the more terrorist attacks you have. Now, I'm a firm believer that the left hate facts because they have no control over facts, and facts don't care about your feelings. So how dare she bring up facts to prove a point? I'll tell you what, the one thing that I found the funniest with Sonia Kruger was She's a TV presenter there to give her opinion, and when she gives an opinion, people call the sacker. Yeah, but the whole program, the whole premise of that program was to get the opinions of the two hosts. Yeah. Now, David Campbell, you you may as well just have a have a teleprompter because he's only reading off the script that he's given. He he's a he's a dead shit. 
Now, yeah, but but, and Sonia Kruger's asked an opinion, and she backed it. And she, she, all she said was she agreed with Andrew Bolt. Now, that was probably as soon as she said Andrew Bolt's name, the red, the red alarm bells probably started flashing off, and everyone was like, quick, duck for cover. She's going to use some logic here. And they, they freaked out about it. But it's the same as Tony Abbott's just been shot down, and he's been lombasted by every media outlet because he said that we need to reassess whether or not we send $40 million to Palestine in aid each year because we don't know where it's going and that that money could be better used here. Well, it's it could be better used here. We need we need that money. We've just cut our pension. Now, we've cut the pension for, for cert, certain pensioners. Now, if we had that $40 million every year, there'd be more money in our budget It'd be more money that we could. It might be a dollar a week. It's it's not much, but charity starts at home, and we should be looking after our own people first. And then you see, we give last year, last financial year, we gave Indonesia. I think it was three hundred and twenty-one million dollars in in aid. And this year, we're about to, as we're projected to give them three hundred and sixty-five point seven million dollars, according to the DFAT website. Now. What? Why? Why is it even acceptable to give close to four hundred million dollars in aid to a country that's just spent about eight billion dollars on their military? Now, if they've got that much money to spend on our own military, sorry, but you can look after your own people. That's not our responsibility. I think if if we want if we've got so much money in our budget for aid. How about we aid our own citizens? How about we go, they go through Melbourne, they go through Sydney, they go through our major cities, they find all the homeless people, and guess what? They put them in the Housing Commission houses, they put them in, in the empty houses that they're saving for these refugees, and we look after our own people first. When we fixed our own yeah. backyard, you can go and fix everyone else's backyard. But you have a look, just those two countries, that's $400 million they're going to save each year. I mean, $400 million, the average house price in Sydney at the moment is just over a million dollars. You, so that's let, let's say they're just buying the average house. They're going to buy that 390 times. The average house, three to four bedrooms. That's 1,600, 15 to 1,600 people off the streets yeah, with a house. Sure. So rather than sent overseas to do God knows what. I mean, nobody knows. Yeah, we're, we're we're not exactly getting receipts from yeah. Indonesia saying where the money was spent. Yeah, We're not getting receipts from Palestine to say, no, 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 we didn't give it to one of the terror terrorist organisations we fund. Yeah, we, so we, we, we didn't bought some kids' yeah, we, to, we, we, instead. We, we promise you that we didn't spend any of that $40 million on weaponry to fire over at Israel. So. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're cer uh, certainly, it's still, like, even though we've had these victories this year, like, just to... You know, say something which is like, like you said, common sense. You can't even, you you, you can't even say that without, you know, the the ABC or you know Buzzfeed jumping out and say, how dare you say that? Yeah, it's like when when Steve Price was having he was having the discussion with uh, what's her name, Van Badham, and she starts acting hysterical. And he says, yeah. "Look, I think you're being hysterical here." And she loses her mind. And the the well-picked left-wing left-wing audience all gasp in horror as he described her hysterical behaviour as hysterical. And then, that, when, when he said, "This is why Trump won," and you had the same. Oh, reaction. that that was what was her name, Jamila something. Jamila yeah. Racing. Uh, uh, she's, she's not. She's not relevant to anything. Her no. name. Her name's something I'm never going to remember. She's. She's a waste of space. She writes she's got up and reason. said. He says. What's he say? The. Uh, you're the people like you are the reason that Trump won. And they go. Whoa, Steve. How dare you? How dare you say that? It's. It, it's a debate. They're having a. They're having a topic of conversation, and she. She's yelling at him and going off at him, and because he. Because he gives her her a fact, but it's people like her, it's left wing nuts that are causing everyone to say, "Geez, I need to get away from this. Let, let's let's move over to the right." And they're, they're the bad guys. I'll, I'll tell you what. When I was young, I was always taught that people who can't react to a certain situation tell others how to act in a certain situation. And I mean, I suppose that that, that is true right there. And the, you can't say that. You can't say this. Yeah, the, apologize. But they. The, the modern day the modern day left these year activists who are and it's the, as I said it's the same activists that are at every single rally you can, it doesn't matter if you're at a Black Lives Matter rally or if you're at a feminist rally or if you're at a pro refugee rally you could take you could take a snapshot 
and half the people at that rally, you'd be able to pick at all the other rallies. They're all the exact same people. <laughs> and yeah, I've got a uh, question. I'm just going to interrupt you. Right. Did, did Melbourne actually have a Black Lives Matter rally? Yeah, there, there, there was one back in I think July, uh, because they, because uh, uh, what's happened with uh, the left have tried to import it here using the uh, indigenous issues to, so they've tried to apply it here. Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. It, it's the they they hate facts because facts back up the conservative argument ninety nine out of a hundred times. But they try to use their own misguided facts, like with the the wage gap fact, and they say, oh, on average, men earn more than women. Well, that's because it, it's come from a false statistic where they interview people on a university campus. But you look as a whole. If they, if they go and find 100 random men and 100 random professions and 100 random women and 100 random professions, there's going to be a lot of those women that have taken time off work to have children and raise children, and there's going to be a lot of women who are doing their, their receptionists or their administration clerks, and then there's going to be men who are coal miners and men who, who work, work in, the, in the sewer plants. And guess what? Those jobs are unappealing, and those jobs pay more money because they're unappealing. Mm -hmm. and the general general statistics show that men are more likely to travel longer to get to work or to work away from home for weeks at a time and to do these undesirable physically labouring jobs which pay higher amounts. So when they say there's a wage gap, it's on an average over over a, a, a random random accumulation of people. No, I think, and, I think, I think what no, well, listen, is it, it is yeah. it is it it's based over over those random amounts of people over random jobs. And those yeah. statistics are never going to be legitimate. No one in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank, you Holden, no one's hiring a male and a woman and paying her three dollars less an hour than the male. It doesn't happen. They're fake statistics, and that's what the left does. They pull fake statistics when they when they jump up and down about the as you're saying the Black Lives Matter in Melbourne. Well. Maybe the reason that there's more Aboriginals incarcerated in Australia than there are white people per capita is because there's more Aboriginals breaking the law than there are white people per capita. Now I know that's that's a crazy that's Tree a crazy heads. thought. Uh, it's a crazy thought that maybe there's more of them locked up because there's down, more of them break, the threats, there's yeah. more of them breaking the law. But yeah. statistics are something the left seem to to fail at. They don't seem to understand how they work. Yeah. Oh, well, we've, we've had a good chat uh, uh, this evening, but we've run out of time, unfortunately. So I'd like to thank uh, both of you for being guests on today's show. No, thank no, you for having us. No worries, mate. Before, before we go, if you have, have you got a second? Uh, yep. yep All right. no. I just want to show I will be publishing it later on. I've made up this little statistic, which I like to call the identity politics hierarchy which I think we, we will be able to use when describing the left's tactics. Because you have a look, on top of their little pyramid, it's Islam. And underneath there's the trans people, and then beneath that you've got your, your LGB, because trans obviously are above them, and then you've got your black people. Now, underneath that, I believe it goes women, and then non-Islamic religious groups, yeah, and your Hispanics, your Asians, and your Islander people. Beneath that... Are you straight people, your white people, your males, your cisgendered, and then police? Because at the moment they hate the police, and at the very, at the very, yeah, and then at the very bottom you've got your Scientologists, who the media just love crapping on. And I reckon for some Greens they put cuddly creatures like your dogs and cats just in that level above the straight white men, the cisgendered, and the police. Now, I think that once once I get this once I get this properly done up, I think it's going to be something that we can use to to back some of our arguments because you never see the media discredit Islam when they kill gay people, and you never see the media discredit anyone gay if they kill someone straight. It's there is an identity politics hierarchy, and it's interesting to note who's on top, who's on the bottom, and how it relates to the way they publish their articles. So, if you'd if you'd like to see that article when it appears, make sure. For all our listeners to check out altconnews.com, uh, they'll, they'll publish that there and also plenty of other new, unique content. Like them on Facebook and I'll provide a link to all of their uh, uh, links on the show notes page. Uh, we at The Unshackled certainly enjoy your contribution to the new media and hope we can work together on future projects down the track. And yeah, we wish you all the best in the coming weeks and months.
So, All right. cheers, mate. Thank Have you. a good one. Have a good one. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. So that's the show for today. I'll be back next week for another review show. Uh, the news cycle will begin to speed up again, so I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about. And also, don't forget to check out the unshackled.net for all the latest all the latest news. And also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and YouTube. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.